Today we're diving deep into the World War II archives to bring you the fascinating tragic tale of the Shokaku, the soaring crane of the Imperial Japanese Navy. This formidable aircraft carrier stood as a beacon of Japan's naval might during the early years of the Pacific conflict. But no matter how high a crane soars, it is not immune to the talons of war. Join us as we journey through time, peeling back the layers of history to explore the events, the drama, and the undeniable human stories behind the sinking of the Shokaku. On the dawn of June 13, 1944, the advanced aircraft carrier Taiho broke away from Tawi Tawi Anchorage in the southwestern Philippines. Accompanied by sister carriers Zuikaku and Shokaku, along with a miscellany of cruisers and destroyers. This vessel served as the command ship for Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa. They headed northeast alongside other units of Japan's first mobile fleet. By June 15th, U.S. forces were breaching Saipan, a Pacific island in the Marianas. The Japanese Empire would suffer a significant setback with the loss of Saipan and neighboring Marianas Islands, as American bombers could now target Japan's home islands. In response, Ozawa conceived Operation A-Go, an elaborate strategy aimed at drawing the American fleet into a favorable position for a Japanese counterattack, not only to protect Saipan, but also to strike a significant blow to the U.S. Navy. However, Ozawa's plan was hindered by two severe challenges, the dwindling strength of his naval forces and a critical fuel oil shortage. The Imperial Japanese Navy had been crippled by substantial losses at Midway Guadalcanal and other battles. Despite this, Ozawa felt that the remaining carriers and battleships were sufficient to carry out his plan. The fuel oil deficit, a consequence of American submarine strikes on Japanese merchant vessels, forced the Japanese to use crude Borneo oil, leading to harmful fumes and engine damage. Unfazed, Ozawa pursued his strategy. The Japanese brought together nine carriers, five battleships, ten heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and numerous destroyers of the first mobile fleet to confront the Americans. The potent U.S. 7th Fleet, led by Admiral Raymond A. Spruance and boasting 15 aircraft carriers, seven modern battleships, and 956 carrier planes, stood in Ozawa's way. This force held approximately twice the aerial strength of the Japanese. Apprehensive about a possible Japanese advance toward Saipan, Spruance prepared for a significant clash. He worried that an enemy force might circumvent his fleet to directly engage the invasion force off Saipan, so he positioned his carriers accordingly. Admiral Ozawa realized that the Americans would need to depend exclusively on carrier-based aircraft around Saipan due to the presence of nearby land bases. Consequently, his strategy leaned on over 500 land-based aircraft operating from Guam, Yap, and Rota. These aircraft were instructed to relentlessly bombard the American carriers before the first mobile fleet's arrival. Ozawa intended to exploit his carrier plane's superior range to strike before the Americans could retaliate. The Japanese fleet, having refueled in the Philippines, started to move eastward. Ozawa and his carriers navigated through the San Bernardino Strait, while the battleships took the southern route through Surigao Strait. Both fleets were detected by vigilant American submarines guarding the Philippines, reporting two significant groups of Japanese ships advancing toward Saipan. This confrontation would become known as the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Meanwhile, two days prior and several thousand miles east in Pearl Harbor, Admiral Charles A. Lockwood scrutinized a map of the Philippine Sea. The American command was bracing for a potential Japanese retaliation against the Saipan invasion. As head of the American submarine forces, Lockwood understood that his submarines could significantly influence the imminent battle. Lockwood designated an imaginary square over the Philippine Sea, assuming any Japanese fleet intending to confront the American invasion at Saipan would inevitably traverse this area. He assigned four submarines, Albacore, Finback, Bang, and Stingray, to maintain watchful patrols within 30-mile radius at each corner of the square. Based on fresh intelligence, he later repositioned the square 100 miles south. Another submarine, Kavala, was not part of the initial patrol lineup, but would play a critical role in the upcoming events. She had already been at sea for weeks. Kavala had left Midway on her maiden war patrol on June 4, 1944. Following her departure from the submarine Tender Holland late in the afternoon, 
she steadily navigated the channel leading to the open ocean, with two planes serving as temporary escorts. Once the channel was cleared, she headed towards the open sea, westward. Kavala was built by the Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut, and was commissioned on February 29, 1944, by Lieutenant Commander Herman J. Kostler. As one of the 73 Gatto-class submarines constructed during the war, she was 311 feet long with a standard displacement of 1,526 tons. Her top surface speed was just over 20 knots, which dipped to less than 9 knots when submerged. Her primary weaponry included 10 torpedo tubes, 6 in the front and 4 in the rear, capable of carrying a total of 24 torpedoes. She also had a deck gun and a selection of light anti-aircraft guns for surface engagement. Following approximately two months of operational readiness tests, trial dives, and crew training, Kavala journeyed to Pearl Harbor via the Panama Canal to join the war. She remained in Pearl Harbor for less than a month before heading to Midway. For her first war patrol, Kostler was to keep vigilance along the eastern Philippines. On June 8, Kavala entered the 500-mile radius encompassing Japanese-held Marcus Island. The submarine's lookouts remained alert for enemy aircraft, as Kavala spent most of the daylight hours cruising on the surface. The next day, they had a unique encounter. A slight impact was felt aft, and shortly afterwards a whale breached a stern in what seemed to be a pool of blood, Kostler recounted. No apparent change in the propeller beat nor any additional vibration has been noted, so it is not believed any damage was done to the propellers. Kavala then continued her relatively uneventful westerly voyage. In the early hours of June 14th, a change in weather became evident. Increasing seas steadily dropping barometer, logged Kostler took several waves over the bridge and down the conning tower hatch with no substantial damage. Kostler drafted a weather update to relay to Pearl Harbor, but due to worsening conditions, the radio operator was unable to transmit it. Opting to weather the storm under the sea, Kostler submerged for most of the day, re-emerging in the mid-afternoon when conditions seemed to be gradually improving. Around 7 p.m., Kavala intercepted a message about a surface contact spotted by the submarine flying fish. Kostler promptly adjusted the course towards the reported location. The sea had considerably calmed down by this time. Storm completely passed us, he marked just before midnight, increased speed to 16 knots to compensate for the delay. As the evening of June 15th rolled in, Kavala reached her designated patrol zone. Kostler started to scrutinize the possible route of the enemy that Flying Fish had reported. She was not alone in her pursuit of the potential target. The following morning, the patrolling submarine spotted pipefish. After exchanging information with the fellow American submarine, it was decided that they would conduct a joint search, with each submarine monitoring one side of the target's reported track. With no contact by 8 p.m., Kostler terminated the search, and Kavala continued within her assigned patrol sector. Several hours later, just before the stroke of midnight, Kavala spotted a convoy that was tentatively identified as two tankers escorted by three ships. Kostler couldn't ascertain if it was the same group that Pipefish and Kavala had been hunting earlier in the day. He spent the early hours of June 17th shadowing the convoy but had to abandon his torpedo attack when a swift Japanese destroyer compelled him to dive deep. By the time Kostler was able to bring his submarine back to the surface, the convoy had disappeared. He fruitlessly pursued them until about 5.30 p.m., when he received orders to relocate to a different patrol zone. Unbeknownst to Kavala's commander, the convoy he had been trailing was one of two supplying Admiral Ozawa's battle fleet. Thanks to the sighting reports relayed by the submarines, Admiral Spruance was certain that the Japanese fleet was mobilizing. These reports offered general positions of the Japanese ships, but American reconnaissance aircraft were unable to precisely locate the enemy carriers. The American planes did spot Japanese float planes, signaling that the enemy fleet was within reach. On June 17th, Ozawa spent the day at sea moving east, striving to stay beyond the range of American carrier aircraft until the conditions were ripe to launch a counter-strike. Kostler gave up on his attempt to track down the tanker convoy, but his luck was about to turn. Mere minutes before 8 p.m. on June 17th, Kavala's SD radar identified a ship, 
At first, it was merely a small blip on the radar screen. The detected contact was moving west-southwest approximately 30,000 yards away. The blip seemed to fade in and out at this distance, so pointed the bow towards the contact and increased to four engine speed, Kostler noted. The distance then started to close quickly. At 22,000 yards, other blips began to emerge on the radar. Kostler deduced that his radar had picked up a substantial task force. The formation was executing regular zigzags and moving at a clip of 19 knots. By 8.15 p.m., seven sizable blips were distinct on the radar display. Kostler accurately speculated that one of these was an aircraft carrier and the other six, arranged in two parallel lines, were likely battleships and cruisers. The aircraft carrier was the closest to the submarine, approximately 15,000 yards away. It became clear to Kavala's commanding officer that he had chanced upon something significant. It was evident at this point that we were tracking a large swift task force, rushing somewhere with urgency, he remarked. Given that we had no information about a previous contact report on this task force, we chose to forego the attack and surface as swiftly as possible to deliver a contact report. It was a challenging decision, but he knew it was necessary for the broader war cause. By 9.30 p.m. all ships from the task force had moved past Kavala, except for two speedy vessels, likely destroyers, hovering near the rear of the group. After nearly an hour of evasive maneuvers using every trick in my playbook, I finally managed to steer clear of the two rearguard vessels and surfaced. Only then was Kostler finally able to transmit a comprehensive contact report to Pearl Harbor. The following day was uneventful as Kavala unsuccessfully attempted to re-establish contact with the task force. At 3.45 a.m. on June 19, an aircraft flew low and close over the submerged submarine, prompting an immediate crash dive. The plane wasn't seen, Kostler recounted, but the roar of its engines was heard in the conning tower as it flew past from starboard to port. Lieutenant Kassler, the officer of the deck, was as pale as a sheet and practically speechless when I arrived in the control room. Kavala continued to intermittently spot aircraft throughout the day, though mostly at safe distances. At 10.39 a.m., a group of four small planes were seen through the periscope, circling at a low altitude roughly 15 miles away. Minutes later, the sound of surface ships came from the same direction. Mass soon emerged on the distant horizon directly beneath the planes, and the sonar operator reported additional vessels beyond what could be viewed through the periscope. Kostler called to arms and began a careful advancement towards the enemy formation. The sight that greeted him during his next periscope view astounded him. When I raised my periscope at that moment, the sight was almost too incredible to believe, he recounted. I spotted four ships, a large carrier flanked by two cruisers on the port bow, and a destroyer approximately 1,000 yards on the starboard beam. Fortuitously, Kavala found itself amid one of the task forces constituting the first mobile fleet. This group consisted of the carriers Shokaku, Zuikaku, and Taiho, the three largest in Ozawa's armada, along with three cruisers and seven destroyers. Kostler invited the executive officer and the gunnery officer to identify the target carrier through the periscope. The ship was accurately recognized as a Shokaku class. The aircraft carrier Kavala was pursuing was indeed the Shokaku herself. This massive flat top made for an enticing target. Launched in August 1941, the carrier, when fully loaded, displaced just over 32,100 tons. It was manned by a crew of 1,660 officers and enlisted men, and had the capacity to operate 72 aircraft. The rapidly evolving situation compelled Kostler to make some swift judgments. I observed that the destroyer on the cruiser's starboard beam might pose a problem, but events were unfolding so swiftly that I had to focus on the carrier and take my chances with the destroyer, he decided. The destroyer was Yurikaze, and from the periscope view, it was evident that she was in a potentially dangerous position. Kostler noted down some particulars as he meticulously observed the carrier minutes prior to the attack. The target featured a large bedspring-type radar mast atop its foremast and was flying a large Japanese ensign, he recorded. He noted that the carrier was recovering aircraft. 
At the time of the attack, only one plane was left airborne, and the forward part of her flight deck was congested with planes, my estimate at least 30, possibly more. Kostler's observation was accurate, as Shikaku was in the process of landing a reconnaissance patrol. Unaware to Kostler, Ozawa's task force had already suffered from an American submarine assault. Earlier that day, nearly 60 miles distant, Albacore had struck Ozawa's flagship Taiho with a single torpedo. The ship's captain perceived it to be minimal damage. With speed reduced by merely one knot and a clear flight deck, Taiho continued her advance into the fray. A casualty of inadequate damage control, she later exploded and sank. Finally, it was Kavala's moment to attack. Kostler had such an optimal firing position that he only needed to raise the periscope thrice during the final approach. At 11.18 a.m., with Shokaku situated 1,200 yards away, he commanded to launch a salvo of six torpedoes set to a depth of 15 feet. Despite the submarine's undetected approach, he remained concerned about the nearby destroyer. The angle on the bow of the destroyer was zero, its range about 1,500 yards, he marked at the moment. Kostler instructed the submarine to submerge while still launching the torpedoes. I fired the fifth and sixth on the way down, he later recollected. Approximately 50 seconds after launching the first torpedo, the crew aboard Kavala heard the resounding boom of an explosion. Two more detonations immediately followed, each with a gap of eight seconds. The last three torpedoes missed, deduced Kostler upon hearing only three impacts. Engaged left rudder and prepared for depth charging and quiet maneuvering. His priority now was to evade the inevitable furious counterattack from the Japanese. By the time Shokaku's lookout spotted torpedoes coming from the starboard side, the underwater projectiles were already dangerously near. The ship's captain promptly commanded evasive action, but it was futile. The torpedoes hit amidships and towards the bow. Shaken by the successive impacts, Shokaku started to list to the starboard and rapidly fell out of formation, with Yurikaze standing guard close by. After orchestrating a crippling assault on an unprepared adversary, Kostler shifted his focus to a safe escape. He was plunging Kavala deep underwater intending to quietly sneak away. The first depth charges detonated a scant two minutes post the torpedo launch. Two volleys of four depth charges came uncomfortably close, the first volley ahead above and to port, and the second volley ahead above and crossing from port to starboard, he documented, evaded at deep submergence. At 11.44 a.m. a destroyer conducted a near pass. High-speed propeller sounds passed directly overhead and reverberated throughout the ship, Kostler recounted. However, no close charges were dropped during this pass. Drenched in perspiration and frayed nerves, Kavala's sailors maintained absolute silence during the depth charge assault. Initially, three destroyers engaged us, but after about an hour and a half, only one destroyer remained. There was no sign of sonar pinging at any point. By 1.30 p.m., it seemed Kavala was making headway in eluding her assailants. Depth charges began to detonate at greater distances, but remained between us and the scene of the attack, noted Kostler. Around this time, JP, our only remaining sound detection system, started to report loud water noises in the direction of the attack. Less than 30 minutes later, Kostler began gradually elevating his vessel to periscope depth. Sporadic depth charges were still echoing from afar, and the underwater sounds persisted in the direction of the torpedo strike on Shokaku. The scenario took a sudden turn at exactly 2.08 p.m. Four tremendous explosions resounded from the direction of the attack, reported Kostler. These were not depth charges or bombs as their rumbling lasted for several seconds. Kavala reached periscope depth approximately 15 minutes later. Nothing in sight, visibility impaired due to rain squalls all around, he observed during his first glance since the attack. Ceased depth charge evasion and silent running. Japanese destroyers had launched 106 depth charges over a span of three hours, with 56 detonating close to the submarine. Shortly before 7 p.m., Kavala broke the water's surface and commenced retreating from the area. After over an hour of travel, Kostler relayed a transmission to Pearl Harbor. He declared that they'd hit a Shokaku-type carrier with three torpedoes, briefly described the subsequent depth charging, and mentioned hearing powerful explosions. With optimism, he concluded, I believe we sank that vessel. This marked the end of an intensely exhausting day. Shokaku, the battle-hardened veteran, had participated in several crucial early war events, including the attack on Pearl Harbor and the battles of the Coral Sea and Santa Cruz. Regrettably, the official Japanese naval records hardly documented her demise. 
While Kavala's commanding officer reported that three of his torpedoes hit the carrier, a few Japanese survivors maintained that actually four had struck. The consensus is that the explosions breached a fuel storage tank, sparking a fire that was initially controlled. Despite heroic efforts to salvage the ship, she remained afloat for several hours. Eventually, Shokaku met her end in a series of cataclysmic explosions heard by Kostler and his team. These blasts could have resulted from a bomb magazine's detonation or the ignition of fuel vapors. The esteemed aircraft carrier plunged beneath the waves, claiming 1,272 crew members. Approximately 570 survivors were rescued by the light cruiser Yahagi and destroyers Urakaze and Hatsuzuki. Kavala faced a ferocious depth charging onslaught after firing the torpedoes that sealed Shokaku's fate, but managed to flee without significant damage. The counterattack burned out motors on two pieces of the submarine's underwater sound equipment, and a ventilation supply pipe was flooded. It was a minor cost for the monumental accomplishment of sinking a Japanese aircraft carrier. The submarine continued its patrol for the remainder of June, receiving orders to set course for Saipan later in the month. Just after 2.30 p.m. on July 1, 1944, Kavala met with the destroyer Philip, which served as her escort for the rest of the journey. The break of day found the destroyer and submarine nearing Saipan. The emerging light revealed a spectacle we won't forget in a hurry, reminisced Kostler. Virtually every class of ship was visible. One side of the war-torn island was shrouded in smoke, and the sounds and sights of gunfire and blasts were clearly discernible from the submarine. Kavala dropped anchor off Saipan's southwest side, joining a diverse collection of vessels. We were informed that Japanese aircraft typically made their runs only at night, Kostler remembered. Nevertheless, lookouts were stationed topside and machine guns were manned in anticipation of the rare daylight assault. At 1.10 p.m., Kavala hosted a group of guests as she replenished her fuel supply from the tanker Kennebago. Staff representatives of Admirals Spruance, Turner, and Hill, along with six war correspondents and a photographer, boarded, Kostler recollected. For the next hour, I was besieged by inquiries. Everyone was eager to learn more about his assault on the Japanese fleet. The visitors left around an hour later and preparations to set sail were undertaken on the submarine. My stay in Saipan was among the most intriguing experiences I've ever had, Kostler reminisced. We were merely a mile from the shore and had a front row view of one of the fiercest battles our marines have encountered to date. Kavala concluded her inaugural war patrol on the afternoon of August 3rd, as she made port in Majuro. The patrol spanned 64 days. She remained in Majuro for the subsequent month, with her crew capitalizing on the time for both training and leisure as the submarine was subjected to routine maintenance. The Battle of the Philippine Sea inflicted such a resounding defeat on the Imperial Japanese Navy that it later became known by Americans as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot due to the extremely lopsided aerial combat. Japanese terrestrial aircraft were unable to hinder the American fleet. Admiral Spruance located the enemy and retaliated mercilessly. Beyond the losses of Taiho and Shokaku to submarines, Ozawa suffered the further loss of a third carrier, Hiyo, and hundreds of aircraft. Various other Japanese vessels incurred different levels of damage. The concluding days of the war saw Kavala assigned to rescue duties off the coast of Japan. She sailed into Tokyo Bay on the final day of August and stayed through the official Japanese surrender on September 2, 1945. She completed six war patrols and is recognized for sinking four Japanese vessels. Nevertheless, it was her first war patrol and the sinking of Shokaku that remained the most notable. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.